aspects of the body's unattractiveness. Their nature will be vivid, clear and unmistakable, though genuinely deep samadhi needs to pave their way. Such images provide the ground for insight to unveil the body's foul, repugnant and objectionable traits, unmasking its impermanence and utter lack of self. You have to bring this kind of vision right inside your heart, till inside knowledge is developed automatically. Originating from within a state of perfect peace, the striking impact of such insight makes the mind stand still. And having seen the body in the way it truly is, a sense of weariness eschewing makes it turn away. Persistently investigating thus will keep reject and ultimately smash the view of personality. It makes an end of all the doubts that may as yet remain about the body as we call this heap of flesh we bear and of all the blind adherence to our practices. In case of illness or disease, no matter how severe, samadhi will be firm and wisdom imperturbable. Your understanding will allow you to discriminate between the mind and body as distinct phenomena. The separateness between the two as indisputable implies the body's nature has been seen with clarity. It is the first embarking on the Noble Eightfold Path, the first clear insight into ultimate reality. The Noble Truths are seen and merge as factors of the path. There is this balanced way of practice where you contemplate whatever you experience, whatever things arise. Some people think that when their formal meditation ends, they can relax and put their meditation object down. Don't be like that. Don't let the work of meditation lapse. Important, unimportant, good and bad, or rich or poor, the young and old, the large and small, as well as black and white, you just observe and keep investigating all the things which are the causes and conditions acting on the mind. When there is thinking going on, then simply know these thoughts and notice how in actuality that's all they are. Thus all phenomena and all impressions in the mind are lumped together as anichang, dukkang, anatta. You neither take them up, nor do you hold or cling to them. This is the graveyard for the varied objects of the mind. You throw them into these three pits abiding by their truth and see them all as equal in the way they really are, as merely Dhamma that arises into consciousness. To practice with the present moment means to deal at once with each phenomenon as it arises in the mind, investigating there and then the moment it occurs. Since Pachupanna Dhamma points to what is here and now, it's rooted in the process spanning causes and effects, encompassing with one accord both cause and end result. The causes of the past come to fruition here and now, and their effects are forming causes for results to come. Thus past and present and the future can be seen as one. The Buddha called it Eko Dhammo, Dhamma Unity. It's not a lot of different things, it's really just this much. You see the present, thus you're seeing what the future holds. You understand the present, thus you understand the past. The past, the present and the future form a solid chain where causes and effects succeed each other constantly. Both past and future link together in the here and now. Abiding in the present moment, you abandon both the past and future, that's the causes and their due results. In fixing mindfulness and wisdom at this halfway point, you'll see a constant process of the rise and fall in all. Where things arise and cease, just to arise and cease again. All that is subject to arising is impermanent. Arising in the present moment, it will have to cease. This is the easiest, least complex way to contemplate, reflecting on the transience of things arising now. Investigating what's uncertain and impermanent will bring you insight into what is permanent and true. For you to really savor peace, you have to bring the mind to where it's firmly centered in the present moment, now. Whatever happiness and suffering arises here, 
you teach yourself repeatedly that that's impermanent. The mind recalling joy and misery as transient implies the wisdom of the Buddha veiled in all of us. And that which recognizes the uncertainty in all denotes the Dhamma of the Buddha latent in the heart. The Buddha and the Dhamma thus are equal, they are one. When transience is known and seen in all conditioned things, all problems due to taking up what's truly valueless will cease and rather than remaining stuck, the mind lets go. The problems caused, the taking up and holding on to things will vanish through this thorough penetration of the truth, which culminates in mind and Dhamma merging into one. Whatever way you look at it, this is the only thing that's really certain. Transience is the intrinsic truth. There's nothing more profound to realize, nothing else to seek. All teachings in the world can be contained within the one concerning the impermanence of all phenomena. I've searched for over 40 years and this is all I've found. Anicca, that and patience and the power to endure. My practice from the early days right up until today was to rely upon this Dhamma of impermanence. Quite frankly, it's a matter where you need to finish off. You're taking up the practice and you see it to the end. You have to see appearances and know where freedom lies. When practice is consistent and your contemplation keen, eventually you reach the point where you are pushing on. You hurry forward, hurry back, you're hurrying to stop. You keep on practicing like this until the point is reached where going forward is not it, yet there is no way back, nor is there any way to stop. It's finished, that's the end. Don't look for anything beyond this point. The task is done. Ki Nasavo, in whom the outflows of the mind have ceased, he won't go forward, won't retreat, and yet he doesn't stop. No stopping, no more coming, no more going. It's complete. That's where you realize emptiness. There's nothing here at all. So this year Lumpur Sumedho is visiting Malaysia along with a group of other monks. The, the idea arose to have a day-long event to commemorate Lumpur Cha's life and his teachings and to invite other teachers, other senior monks who trained with Lumpur Cha, as well as the newer generation we call disciples of Lumpur Cha, although many of us never actually uh, lived with him or trained with him or received uh, instructions directly. But because it's a living tradition and one which uh, instructions given orally and also one in which instruction is given by example and through living in close community. Uh, we today, we still feel a very strong connection with our teacher. Lung Po means Venerable Father. And so uh, the 16th of January uh, in Kuala Lumpur in, uh, in Sentul is going to be uh, uh, an occasion for many of us to share not so much our direct experience with Lung Po Cha, but why uh, the influence of this uh, very small man physically uh, is so great and widespread all around the world and even to this day able to uh, inspire uh, new generations of spiritual seekers. Well, I'm very impressed with this whole event. These days in the world, it's just so rare to have an inspiring occasion, um, something which is uh, on the level of a rock concert, but a whole lot more wholesome. Uh, the people who organized this event from the very beginning uh, had such a wonderful, good intention. I think the good karma that's going to come from that uh, will just be tremendous for them. And the fact that we can get together so many uh, Sangha members, uh, monks and nuns from so many different uh, traditions here uh, all together uh, dwelling in harmony uh, coming together in harmony listening to the Dhamma in harmony 
uh, paying homage to the Triple Jam and to our teachers in Harmony. This is, uh, is really a rare and special occasion. Ajahn Chah is mind-boggling really how much he has been able to coalesce uh, people's wholesome intentions from around the world. The fact that he, one simple man from the countryside in Northeast Thailand has been able to draw people together from all different cultures around the world, not just in his lifetime, but also after he's passed away, it is just phenomenal. And to have the opportunity to come together and to pay homage to him uh, out of a deep respect for his practice, a deep respect for his liberation, now that, uh, uh, it's a great honor uh, to be able to be part of that. So I would like to share any of the merits that have come from this, uh, this wonderful event here in Kuala Lumpur uh, today and this evening to um, all the people who went through all the difficulty of organizing it and all the wonderful volunteers and all of the wonderful Sangha members who have participated and most importantly, in memory of Ajahn Chah, may all beings be freed from suffering. I'm very happy to be here and uh, I had no way of knowing what uh, the situation would be like when I first was asked to take part in this event and uh, certainly it's turned out to be uh, most impressive with all the people here that have such enormous interest in the uh, Thai forest tradition or in the forest tradition uh, in general uh, of which Ajahn Chah uh, as we know was um, one of the uh, most outstanding teachers who's uh, life has touched and uh, reached so many uh, to this day all around the world. And so having now been uh, invited to take part in this, I'd just like to really express my, express my appreciation uh, for the organizers who have done such a lovely job in doing this.